summaries have been from this magnificent <coughs> second, or pardon me, eighth chapter of the book of Romans. When we transition, as I said earlier, from the seventh chapter to the eighth chapter, the Apostle Paul specifies the difference between the law and grace. And last Sunday we talked about how the Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit has been given to us when we receive Christ as Savior and Lord. And that we have literally been made a child of the living God, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Today we're going to be talking further about that eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this day, we open your word, we expect to hear from you. I ask today, Father, for a special anointing of your Holy Spirit as I bring forth this message that it would be according to your will to meet the needs of all present here. And I trust you and I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Drop the Bible a little bit ago. You'd think I would know better than that. <laughs> the first church that I pastored was a little tiny church up in Wyoming for about three years. And I didn't have a pulpit. I spent every Sunday like this. In front. Lots of practice. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is writing about creation. And he's writing about where creation and the creation of the body of Christ is headed. We've already had our scripture reading this morning. I'm going to start just a little bit further back with verse 19 of Romans 8. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation waits. Why would the creation be waiting? Well, you see, when we were created, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, God placed the authority of creation with humanity. He owns the heavens and the earth, but he made humanity the stewards, the people who are responsible for the heavens and the earth, sort of like a servantship. Okay? Well, what's going to be revealed here, what you're going to see is that the way that humanity went affected creation. Because Adam and Eve sinned, creation sort of got messed up. God talked about that to Adam. He said, to Adam, he said, the ground from this point on, it's cursed. It's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. And in order to make a living from it, you're going to be the sweat of your brow. You're not just tending the garden anymore. Now it's going to get hard. Watch. Yeah. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. The word there, futility, in the Greek language, in, in the original text, means like folly or nonsense. In other words, we look around us in creation. We look around at the world around us. I call it flawed elegance. There is still great beauty to it, but there is also a lot of problems with it. Okay? Problems like storms and earthquakes and, and so on that, that affect the creation that was never intended to begin with, but because of the fall of humanity and because humanity had authority over the earth, the earth was subjected to that futility. Verse 21, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When we are resurrected, 
when the children of God are revealed in glory, the earth gets fixed at the same time. Now, if, if, if you go back and look in the book of, of Revelation, what you'll see there is that that corruption that falls upon the earth continues on in judgment, especially in the last half of the tribulation period, that's seven years. And in that last three and a half years, I mean, the whole planet gets wrecked. We're talking seas that instead of water are blood. And all of the animals in the sea have died. And the water that is flowing from the streams and creeks and rivers and, and so forth has also turned into blood and is poison. The sun is beating down on the earth and scorching the earth. And men that have adopted that mark of the beast, there is a terrible scourge of disease that falls upon them. The, the whole planet is wrecked in the last half of that tribulation period. And then Jesus comes back. And the scripture says that that resurrection of the righteous dead is completed in the tribulation martyrs that are resurrected at that time, those that were killed for their devotion to Christ in the last half of the tribulation period, and they are raised to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years on the earth. The earth is going to get fixed from all of that trouble and all of that destruction that takes place. The creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. That, that flawed elegance that we see here in the earth the whole earth is literally groaning, waiting, waiting until it can be perfected again the way it once was. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead in a body that is glorified and is incorruptible, the believer too will be resurrected in a body just like the body of Jesus. This is not the end. This is not the final product. Okay? The scripture says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and that we will be resurrected in the same way that Christ was resurrected. He was the first fruits to show us exactly what it was going to be like, and we will follow. We ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, bearing witness, remember? Clear back the first part of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free or exempt from the law of sin and death. So we already have the Holy Spirit if we have received Christ. The first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. I find that the older I get, the more I grow. <laughs> but what he's saying is, we inhabit these bodies that are subject to corruption and age and disease and injury and all the various different things. He says, that's not the best that God has for us. The best that God has for us is in Jesus, and we are awaiting the manifestation of that. Now watch. For in hope, verse 24, 
we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. This is teaching us the difference between faith and hope. Faith and hope. Faith is always right now. It's right now. Hebrews chapter 11 says, For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. See, that, that sounds almost like a contradiction. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. See, because the Word of God says, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God produces faith in us. There is no other word that produces faith. If you're depending on something else besides this word and believing in something else besides this word, you're in big trouble. Because it's by the Word of God that faith comes. And now listen carefully. It doesn't say faith comes by having heard the Word of God. It says faith comes by hearing. And hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. That's what we're doing today. We're going back into the Word of God and we are reiterating what God has said and what God has promised to us. And that produces the faith that is right now and points towards the hope for what's coming. Watch carefully. We groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons of redemption of our body. For in hope, we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he already sees? That word in the Greek text, in the original Greek text, means a confident anticipation. A confident anticipation. How many of you have kids? Okay, lots of kids. Think of this. It's Tuesday. Your children are playing. And you say to your children, guess what? This Saturday, we're going to the carnival. What do your children say? Do your children stand there and go, oh, we will going to see it. <laughs> what do your kids do? Oh, boy, we're going to the carnival. We're going to the carnival. See, it, it's Tuesday. It's not Saturday. But your children, because of your word, have a confident anticipation of what is going to happen. That's the difference between faith and hope. We hear the word of God, we hear the promises of what God has told us in his word. We understand that he's already given us the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And so we have hope. We have a confident anticipation that what he has promised, he's going to fulfill. If we hope, for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Perseverance, confident anticipation. A confident anticipation that what God has promised, he will fulfill. Now we've got to keep hearing the word, because you know, faith comes by hearing, not by having heard it. So we've got to stay with the Word of God. We've got to reiterate it into our lives to the renewing of our minds over and over and over and over again to maintain that faith and the hope, the confident anticipation that what He has promised, He will also fulfill. Have you received Christ as your Savior and Lord? If you've made that choice, if you've made that decision, if you've said to Jesus, hey, I want in. I want you to be my Savior too. I want your forgiveness. 
I want the righteousness that you give me, the very righteousness of God, and I want to follow you, and I want you to be my Savior for all eternity. It's not hard to do. It's not difficult. When I got saved, I was 15 years old. I'd been reading a book that had been given to me about the tribulation and the terrible times that would come in the seven years of the Great Tribulation. And I was saying to myself, whoa, I don't want to be around for that. I've been raised in the church, gone to Sunday school and church services, but I wanted to be absolutely sure, absolutely certain that I was saved. Well, I had heard people give their testimonies about getting saved, about how when they received Christ, it was like a great weight was lifted off of their shoulders, and like they felt this whole newness in their being. And I thought, that's what I want. And so I prayed, Lord, please save me. <laughs> you know, and I'm waiting for the weight to be lifted off my shoulders. <laughs> And I've been going through that for probably a week or two. And of all times and places, I was in the back seat of the car and we were on our way to church on Sunday evening. And my dad had the radio on and there was a preacher preaching on the radio. And here's what he said. He said, when we ask the Lord to save us, you need to know that Jesus is a man of his word. And that if you ask him to save you, he will save you. You need have no doubt of it ever. And so I heard that and I thought, oh, well, I'm waiting for some sort of evidence. And what he's saying is I don't have to wait for anything. All I have to do is ask and have the confidence that he will do what he said he would do. And so right there in the back seat of the car, on the way to church on Sunday evening, I asked the Lord to save me. I said, Lord, I know that you keep your word. And if I ask you to save me, I know you will. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you know what? Yeah. I felt like a whole weight was lifted off. <laughs> yeah. But see, it had to come with faith. I had to. I had to express it in terms of response to his promise that he would save me. And I didn't have to have any doubt about it at all. So that's where we are. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And once we have that faith, what we are left with then is the confident anticipation, the hope that what he has promised, he will fulfill. Musicians. Let's stand again.
cast all of our cares upon you that we may have your peace in our lives. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.